Well, I think one of the things is, again, not looking at the result. Something that really has grown very evident in me, and it came from being a teacher, and in that the work that we always do in my classroom is process work, not product work. Always. And because what we want to do when we, I think when we go into the audition room is we want to show, we want to show these people, Hey, this is what this song does to me. And it's not polished and it's not perfect, but I'm right. I'm in the moment and I'm in the music. And what I think it is, is if you can come into, if we're using musical theater, which I think applies to going in for a job interview or, you know, um, anything that we're doing to put our, our work out there that we come in and say, this is me in the process I'm in with this material and how I, I want you to see how I play with material. I want you to witness me being in my experience. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Sherry, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Oh, Srini, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so you wrote in and uh, told me a little bit about your story. And when I saw that you had a background in theater, I was just kind of blown away by how you've mixed multiple art forms together. Um, You know, to me, it was so intriguing because I'd never come across anybody with a background like yours. I was like, yeah, this is unmistakable. We have to tell this story. (laughs) But uh, before we get into what you do and and your your work, I want to start with uh, a question that I've asked a handful of times, and I'm curious to see how this turns out. So the question is, Do you have siblings? What birth order are you? And if so, what impact has the birth order had on the choices that you've made with your life? Okay. I love that question. Um, I am the second child. I have an older sister. We're estranged. We haven't spoken in uh, six years. Um, She's actually kind of a uh, a, a bad seed in the family. What I will say and how it's impacted me artistically has less to do with the order in which we're born and my sister not having any, uh, or my sister having a, um, you know, a, a strict hold on what she's able to do and me being <laughs> able to run around on the streets without anybody looking um, is not as important as me finding that the conflicts that we've had in our relationship and the lack of communication, the lack of emotional expression that we've been able to have with each other has really influenced uh, my insistence on the emotional expression in the students that I work with and the people that I collaborate with, that I'm able to have healthy, expressive relationships with them because I'm not able to have it with my sister. Hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting that you, know, you take something that on the surface appears horrible and you channel it into something uh, like your work and, and you know, channel it through your students. Why do you think that some people are unable to do that? Un- are unable to like the it? idea that you don't have a relationship with your sister or that you're estranged from her and you haven't spoken in six years you know having a sibling like i you know i mean it's not like my sister and i are like the best of friends but i mean six years like i can't imagine not talking to her for six years um and yet you've turned that into a positive and i'm curious why you think that is and, and why you know you don't see that as as frequently in other people Wow. I love that question also. Um, well, Srini, there's two things that I'm thinking of. Um, one is our relationship was destructive throughout the course of our, our lifetimes together. And she does have destructive relationships with my parents too. And, um, she's just a troubled person. And I think how I've able, been able to channel it is, or, or how people might not be able to channel it or they get stuck is that when things, that are traumatic happen to you. So t- say I use my sister as an example of a traumatic thing that's happened to me. Um, and a couple have, which have all influenced, you know, have influenced everything that I do, which I'm interested in getting into with you too, mm-hmm. is I think that sometimes people get traumatized and at an early age, and it could be with, you know, an ill person in their family or an alcoholic father or, uh, you know, it could be anything. And sometimes what that does is it traumatizes people into shutting down their nature Um, and I think that they end up either denying it or 
going to pursue it and having it sabotage itself in some way. Because when traumatic things happen, they end up affecting your nervous system. And your nervous system starts making choices for you. And I do believe that there was a certain extent where my experience with my sister did traumatize me into not being an expressive person or a healthy person or a person who's in service or a person who's kind. You know, there were things that that created limitations on me and part of the personal work I had to do to get over that and other things that I found were traumatic too as I started to grow up is that um, you've got to work through those things in order to come through or else you're not going to ever come through or even maybe not even know why you don't come through. (laughs) And you might just settle and be somebody who wishes they did that, but it just never came to be. Mm -hmm. Do you ever ever think about calling her or do you ever wonder about Uh, reconnecting? I have reached out to her on multiple levels, um, and every time I do, I don't get responded to. Um, and it's interesting too because I would say that my sister's a classic narcissist. And if you have any, if you've ever had a relationship, or any of um, of our listeners today have had relationships with narcissists, it's a really, really interesting dynamic because their filter isn't isn't what I would call clean. They don't have a clean filter, so they don't filter information clearly. So again, that's something that has influenced me as an artist because to be able to identify that and say, I don't want to be like that, or I don't want to be a person who responds to something like that. I've got to clean my filter. I have to clean my own filter so that I can uh, uh, intuit and interpret life in terms of what's really going on and not based upon how I feel that things are going on or how I think things are going on, but to try to be in reality as much as possible. Um, And I insist that in my students as well. So... I believe that answers your question. I have reached out to her, but her filter is not clean. (laughs) So, and I can't clean it for her. (laughs) I'm curious, like what uh, the timeline uh, is for sort of this dismantling of your relationship with your sister. Is it something that was just prevalent throughout your childhood or were you guys ever close? Never. Uh, We would go back and forth and have some moments of sharing here and there. But, um, but I would say fundamentally she created a dangerous environment that I was never really safe. I was never really a safe person in her company because if she ever got me to share, uh, when her mood would change or she would get into a bad mood or something would happen, she would take the things I would share with her and she would, you know, spill the beans on me or tell my family or humiliate me with those things. So she created a fundamentally unsafe environment and it had, has taken me many years to uh, break down the feeling of being unsafe in the world. And in fact, Srini, there were, have been those things that I mentioned earlier where I've been in other traumatic situations. I mean, I, I could speak on them really clearly now because I've been in a lot of therapy about it, but you know, I was hit by a car and in, I had a near death experience and that was very unsafe. And I was also mugged at gunpoint as an adult, which is another very safe, unsafe, uh, life threatening situation. So I've been somebody who's kind of always had her nervous system think that she was in danger because I was around an unsafe person. And then my nervous system had more unsafe experiences. How these, I began to dismantle these things as an adult, um, And as a teacher around the same time, because it was my goal and my purpose to be somebody who made other people feel safe so that their creativity could come through. So I was at once providing a safe environment for other people, uh, for who they really are to come through while I was figuring out how to be safe in the world myself. Hmm. And I think that that's been the greatest gift of creating Rock the Audition and what I created is that. It started out as something that was meant to be healing for other people, and then it became something that healed me at the same time. Funny how that works, isn't it? Isn't it? It's nuts. But yeah, I'm still working through that. I'm still fixing patterns in my nervous system that need to change, uh, so I feel safer in the world. And I'm practicing that in the world and also you know, holding the students and the teachers who I work with to, you know, uh, use me as a safety net until they feel safe themselves. So I guess that raises a question of the, of the path that leads to, uh, you know, doing this work around theater, uh, kind of, you know, where it started, what led you there? Were you one of these people in, in high school who was in the theater and like, you were just kind of destined to go down this path right from the get go, or was there something that, you know, kind of led to it? Oh yeah. Srini, I'm definitely like, I was always a ham. I, I, um, 
have a natural, I've always had a natural talent for it. Um, and you know, when I was 13 years old and doing community theater up in Westchester, I, you know, my te- uh, the, a voice teacher in town, like put her hand on my shoulder and she was like, you have to study with me because you've got the thing and it needs to be honed. So, um, so it started that way. I did high school theater. Really, um, in terms of my path of being a professional performer, I did go to school for musical theater. But funny enough, in the same conversation, I found uh, the college environment to be an unsafe environment. Now, whether it really was an unsafe environment or not, I don't know. But I knew that I felt unsafe there. So I ended up quitting school. Uh, when I, after my freshman year and I came to the city, which would, you would imagine would be the most unsafe place in the whole world. And I, I became very safe here. Um, and I started, uh, studying musical theater and I joined two theater companies. So over the course of, from my 19 until about 22, 23 years old, I basically, um, trained myself on the job. So I would get an acting job just from pure raw talent and I would learn whether or not I was succeeding at it by how the audience was responding to me, how my scene partners were responding to me, you know, what, how was I serving the piece and was I making the piece better or clearer? You know, these were things that I just did on, on the job. And from that, that's how I was able to have, you know, somebody, I was doing a, you know, a schlocky show in the East, in some East Village theater, you know, with some rats and some cool performers and a friend of mine brought a fancy agent and said, I want you to see this girl. She's very green, but she's got the thing. And so he saw me and signed me the next day. And, uh, that's sort of how the whole ball got rolling to a certain extent. I'm kind of glad that I self-trained because there wasn't anybody at college telling me that I couldn't do that, or I'm not the right type for that, or I'm working on the wrong material, or that's not who I am, or I'm not an ingenue. I just pursued material with my spirit, and if it felt true to me, I pursued it. And people responded to me so positively because I did not censor myself artistically because I didn't have a a college censoring me. I have to ask about the artistic censoring and, and sort of oh, this yeah. uh, creativity getting weeded out of us because, you know, we had Chase Jarvis here very recently. And yeah. uh, if you've heard that, you probably heard oh, him yeah. say, you know, this gets weeded out of us from a very, very early age. Absolutely. And you seem to have basically uh, bypassed that sort of weeding out and programming. And I'm yes. wondering why you think that is. And more importantly, if we weren't able to bypass that sort of weeding out and that programming that happens that kind of weeds the creativity out of you, um, how do you get it back? Um, another fantastic question, but what else is new with you? Um, <laughs> um, so uh, I dodged it, like I said, because I didn't go uh, – the particular program that I did go to at the time, um, it was oh, it was in a, some kind of a transitional space. So really nobody noticed me. Um, and I didn't, so I kind of like fell through the cracks. And when I came to the city, I was with a bunch of people who I was with two theater companies and we all created original material. We created original, um, you know, we created original musicals and everything that we did was original and new and fresh and alive. And so we, we practiced being inventive and creating new things. One of the things that I've noticed with colleges, especially being a teacher of musical theater and, I have had the great gift of being able to visit, um, I think it's 56 pro- musical theater programs in the last four years that I've been able to come to and create relationships with these programs. What I notice is that there's something that goes on with musical theater programs where they go, okay, you are a soprano, and you, so that makes you an ingenue, and, that, and you're skinny, So these are the songs you should sing and these are the roles you should play. And then they give you the songs and you play the roles and you go out into the world. And your job is to say, this is my type. This is how I live that type out. And this is how I can play your roles. But what happens is, is that a lot of schools don't ask you, who are you? Who are you? And it happens a lot um, around people of color, especially because they're like, okay, you are black. And you're a baritone and you're plus bodied. So you're going to play these 
plus bodied baritone black roles. <laughs> so you get put through, I hate to use this word again, a filter based upon what you sound like and what you look like. And that shuts down people's natures. And that's why I love working in popular music because you don't have to be anything to sing anything. You could be a woman who's six foot tall with a hump on her back, you know, and you could sing Joni Mitchell. And if it, you feel it, I'm going to cast you <laughs> as the lead. Mm-hmm. And so that's what popular music is so great about because there's no type, there's no archetype. You can't fall into any, uh, you can't, it, and it's all about how do you feel and who are you and how do you interpret this material. The problem that I've noticed is that people, if you don't fit in the, if you don't fit into any of these archetypes or these types, so say you're not a soprano, um, say you're not a comedic sidekick belter, they put you into this qual- category called quirky, which means I don't know what to do with you. And if they don't know what to do with you, you don't get looked at. And you graduate and you've never been explored at all. So not only do you not know who you are, you don't even know where to put yourself. You're talented because they picked you, but you don't even know what your talent is like. So what I've noticed a lot happens is, is that people feel like they've wasted their time in college, they weren't seen, and that it isn't until after college that that's where they start doing self ex- the, the self-exploration that was never encouraged in them. That's where they start doing soul searching. That's where they start exploring their inner terrain. Who am I? How do I feel about this? Maybe they go to therapy. Maybe they go to acting classes in the city. Maybe they get to study with me. And between all of those things, they get asked, but how do you feel about your life? Because I know nobody asked you. <laughs> you know, and I, so I find a lot of the time how to find it is you've got to take all of those people who said, I don't know what to do with you or people who didn't notice you at all. And you have to notice yourself. You've got to take the initiative and go, well, I, just because nobody asked doesn't mean that I'm not valuable. That means I got to ask myself. And, and I've noticed that a lot of people thrive when they do the personal work after college. That's where people really thrive. You know, it's really interesting to hear you describe this process because I feel like it's applicable to just about anybody. It doesn't matter whether you're trying to have a creative career as what you're pursuing because I'm listening to you say that and I can't help about think about my entire experience of college of being kind of put into boxes or choosing from the options that were put in front of me, not realizing that there might be some other way. Yeah. And sometimes you just have to go, I don't believe that that's the only way in my core. I don't believe it. You said no to me, but I don't believe it. And so it's from that, from that, from being not seen or not acknowledged or put into a pigeonhole. That's where we have to really dig into our feelings and go, but what do I really feel? Does this really feel true to me in my core? And that's where you get to explore who you are and how you feel. And, you know, you might say, in my career, you might go, you know what, maybe I don't have what it takes to be a Broadway star, but I do love theater. Maybe I want to write. Nobody encouraged that in me because they didn't take the time, but I have it in me to be creative and expressive. So let me figure out, maybe I'm a writer, maybe I'm an agent, maybe I'm a producer, maybe I'm a teacher, you know, or maybe I am a great actress. I mean, I don't remember if this, it, I believe this is who it is. But I, I may be totally wrong. And if I'm totally wrong, please don't mind me. But I remember hearing a story about who I think is Christine Lottie, that incredible actress, where at school they said to her, they took her aside and said, you know, I really don't think you have what it takes. You're not good looking and you're too tall and la, 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 la. And they told her all this stuff at a really good acting program. This woman has worked every day <laughs> of her life on television, in films, because something inside her said, I don't believe you. And so I, to me, it's really about listening to your spirit and going, are you telling me the truth? And what makes you the person that knows that this is the reality? And really asking yourself that question and exploring everything that never got to be explored. And, and you're so right. It could be about being a mathematician. It could be about being an engineer. It's really taking the information of somebody saying no, or you're not, or this is all you, all you are, and then asking yourself, is that true? So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. 
But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. So I can't help but ask you um, about persistence and grit, um, especially <laughs> because you know, you've chosen a profession, which it requires a hell of a lot of both. Woof. And the, the reason I have to ask this is, you know, I think as a society, we're very encouraging of persistence and grit when the outcomes of what we're doing are guaranteed. Like, you know, nobody will, you know, sl- will call you out for being gritty about your pursuit of becoming a doctor or a lawyer or engineer. But if you're gritty at something that the outcome is not guaranteed in, it's not something that's necessarily societally encouraged. I'm curious how you've dealt with that and how you've, you know, developed grit as a byproduct of the work that you've done. Well, um, you know, I think the one good thing about me is that there's never, ever been a question in anybody's mind about my talent. I think everybody in the business and in the industry, if anybody's ever going to say anything about me that's positive, they would say she's an, uh, an, uh, a, uh, an unstoppable, unmistakable creative force that, and there are no limits to my creativity. I think that that's the one that on the good side of that, that's what anybody would say to me in terms of the pursuit and the persistence of it. It is exceedingly difficult because on some level, it doesn't matter whether you have that or not. So much of the business is who, you know, uh, timing, um, you know, um, the kind of support that you have, And then in other circumstances, there's just what we go through as human beings and how we struggle with um, rejection. Rejection is something that performers and directors and music directors and, you know, anybody who and um, designers and um, and anybody, anybody who's a creative person, the level of rejection that we uh, go through is so um, it's destructive and it ruins people. And it's one of those things where I've seen it turn friends into drug addicts. I've seen it make people leave the business. Um, I've seen it make people self-destruct. And I've seen it also do with other people what it does with me, which is that when I was first introducing Rock the Audition to people and saying, hey, I teach people how to audition for rock musicals. And people were like, you what? What? And I say, yeah, I teach people how to study popular music so they can audition for rock musicals. And people were like, I don't get it. I had to knock on so many doors and tell people what I was doing and have so many people go, I have to think about that. And then have people say, wow, that sounds really cool. And then still not take me. So there was so much knocking on doors and having people say, it sounds like a great idea, but I can't help you. Even reaching out to agents and reaching out to investors and going, I have this great idea and have people say, that's a brilliant idea. I have no idea how to help you because no one's ever done it before. So we don't have a formula for you to follow. So we don't know if it's a, we don't know if it's even going to make it because we have no formula. So I've had so many no's and I've had so many doors close on me and I've had people say, yes, I'll take you because you're famous. And then they take me and then they don't know what to do with me. So I end up having to do it myself. I mean, there's been so much, um, I've had so many strikes against me and I've had to pick myself up off the floor 150,000 times. And the thing that always picks me up off the floor is believing that what I'm doing matters. There's this inner thing inside of me, maybe as nuts as, you know, Joan of Arc had, (laughs) it's nuts. But when you know you've got something that matters and you know it and it keeps you up at night and it makes you and and it's the reason why you, you know, do everything you do, you got to that's the thing that's got to pick you up uh, off the floor and dust you off and sew you back up. 
and put you back out. And sometimes I would go back on the street and, and knock on the doors and I'd be cross-eyed. Sweeney, I would be cross-eyed. Like I couldn't, I would look at people and be like, blah, 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 blah. and they would be like, you're a mess because <laughs> you're exhausted and you haven't slept in months because you're hustling. Come back when you got, you know, go get some sleep and come back and try again. And then I'd come back and try again and they'd still say no. You know, and so the adversity or the grit or the fight I have in me really comes from the connection I have to believing that I, I have an indelible mark to leave on the world. And it's not a mark that's being left for my ego. It's being left there in order for my community to heal and change and grow and prosper. And when I put my head down on my pillow at night, and sometimes I fall asleep with all my clothes on and the lights on, sometimes sitting up with my fingers still on the keys. When I fall asleep, I can at least go, hey, I, I, I made an impact today on somebody. And that's going to make me knock on another door tomorrow. Hmm. So let's do this. Let's shift gears a little bit. Okay. Um, I want to talk about creative process because yeah. you're – uh, you know, blending art forms that I personally am not, you know, intimately familiar with. So I want to talk about sure. um, creative habits, systems, processes. I mean, probably the big question is how each art form influences the other, right? You know, you're a musician, you're an actor, you're also somebody who coaches people in auditions. So how do how do all these things impact each each other? Like, what have you taken from each art form that you apply to the other one? Wow, uh, I love that. Um... The other thing that I'm doing that's really cool that I could even add to that, which adds another uh, art form all within it uh, within itself, is that musical theater is starting to show up on national television. So one of the things that's going on is like, and, and it's great for me because it's a lot of rock musicals because their audiences are, you know, teenagers and young adults. So even in the last couple of months, we've seen The Wiz on national television, Grease, Hairspray's coming. Um, and, um, it's just going to keep going in that direction. So now I'm working with the medium of how do you act musical rock musical theater for television? Because acting musical theater on a stage energetically is even different than acting it for the camera. So on top of working with music and acting and synthesizing the body and the voice and the emotion, so that you're authentic in the world of the music, which I'll talk to you about in just a second. Then we also have to consider how to do that and be and feel like we're watching you on television rather than watching you on stage in a, you know, 2100 seat theater. They're like the, the art form is adapting and changing. So I kind of have a multi-step <laughs> or a multi-level or multi-faceted training program that kind of covers all these bases. So the, the first thing I'll tell you about it is in, you know, what we call legit or legitimate musical theater training, you know, you train the singing voice and then you look at the show or you look at the musical and you go, okay, what character am I? And what is my relationship with the other characters in the show? And when I sing this song, how do I embody this character and move this plot? And this is the general formula of legitimate musical theater. When people started asking for popular music, no one had defined how to perform it. So I was the one who took it upon myself to, to create that definition. I don't know how I, I don't know how I became that person. But I am the one who literally wrote the book on how to do it. And so what I started to do was study myself. Um, I started to do an anthropological slash archaeological dig on pop culture and history and music and behavior. And I started to think, well, let's look at time and let's look at what happens through time. And if we look at the 50s and 60s, what was going on in the world? Well, what was going on in the world during that time where people were pristine and clean cut and appropriate and they said please and thank you um, and the music was, you know, percussive and clean and it was meant to dance to and if it was a ballad, it was meant to make out to. It was a very innocent time. Um, but then there was also segregation, which was not innocent <laughs> or appropriate or pristine and that we, had to keep, we have to keep in mind that when we're looking at musicals that live in that world, that they are about integration and segregation. So musicals like Motown, Memphis, Beautiful, um, 
all shook up, Hairspray, so many of these musicals are about that. So then I think, all right, well, if we're going to get you auditioning for musicals in this time period and succeeding at it, you have to study the history of what was going on in the world, what were people like, what was the music like and why, what would you be like if you were there? Like, take yourself back to that time period, and when you sing this Marvin Gaye song, can you integrate when you sing? So if you are a Caucasian person, can you be like, oh, I love Marvin Gaye. Um, look at what he's done to my voice. He's made me a better singer and a cooler dancer because he's influenced me as a person of color. And then people of color get to say, hey, I get treated subhuman, but I have two minutes to show you what I'm like as a person. So I get to integrate too when I sing. I get to say, this is my music. This is how I feel. I'm a human being with feelings. See me. And let's both get on the dance floor. And let's dance together because I'm the same as you. And you love my music. So if you love my music, love where the music came from because it came from a real rough place. And so that's, the, that's how it started is that I started to, to take people back into time and get them to put themselves into the world in which their music lived. And all of a sudden it's not about what character and what show and what, what, you know, what, uh, what, um, what plot am I trying to move, but like I'm standing on a street corner singing doo-wop, and I'm there, and how would I feel like I'm authentically there? Or I'm singing to, I'm a white girl singing to a brown boy about how much I love him. And I'm feeling the depth of how not okay it was during that time. So I'm inviting people to use history and their, and their imagination to create characters that are based on themselves. And that's how I created this whole entire thing. So we translate that into musical theater and auditioning and performing. And then we translate that into what would that be like? And what would those feelings be like if they were subtle? Um, if they were television sized so that you were able to live in a big world and live in a small world with the depth and the breadth of the history of the world that was going on at the time. And then I applied that to, I applied that to Motown. I applied that to the seventies folk rock era, the Vietnam era and the disco era. And so that's basically how I've learned how to create, um, a place for people to what I call research and soul search. <laughs> You know, I am really curious uh, if you have people who come to you who have no interest in theater at all, but find something in this work that is healing, because you talked about the idea that, you know, this was healing for you as, as well as it was for your students. And I'm curious what kinds of outcomes you've seen in the lives of people as a byproduct of this work. Well, I accept everybody when I teach. And that the part about that, and, and you know what the best part about it is? The people who come in who don't want to be in a Broadway show, who don't, who, whose goal is not to be, uh, whose only goal is to express themselves, most of the time become the greatest leaders in the class because they're not judging themselves. They're not sabotaging themselves. They're not shutting themselves down. You know, they're not harming themselves out of fear. They're just going, you know what? I just want to express myself. And my only goal is to feel good and be in this music. So funny enough, the people who don't have any intention of pursuing this professionally oftentimes are the great leaders of the class and teach the professional performers to get off of themselves and leave themselves alone and have fun and enjoy the process of digging into a good Motown tune or, you know, um, feeling like they could be, you know, at the disco with the disco ball spinning and everybody on the dance floor and not go, is this right? Is this okay? Am I doing it right? Mm -hmm. So funny enough, we've, I've had some people come in there just for fun and completely uh, give the entire class permission to be human and free without any judgment. I love and those, that. Pe those people, those people grow so, so much that, um, that not only is it by going, wow, uh, I'm creating this sense of, you know, cause we get, a, we, we, when we go into a different time period, especially with the young people, cause they only look at what's in front of them, unfortunately, but especially with the young people, they, when you look back and go, wow, what would I be like if my husband was going off to war and I had no idea whether he was alive or dead because there were no cell phones, there was no television, there was nothing I could, there was no, there was a television. We watched our husbands and our fathers and sons die on television, but I mean, there was no, there was no form of communication. You know, we couldn't communicate via Skype because it was 1968. 
um, what would I feel and what would I be like if I was there? It creates empathy and consciousness. And these things are gifts to anybody, whether you're a performer or not. It makes you a richer human being to dig into history and wonder what you'd be like. Wonder how things would hit you. Wonder what kind of a person you would be. Would you be a follower or a leader? Again, would you be an integrator or a segregator? You know, would you be a disco queen? Uh, or would you be on the dance floor, you know, just quietly shaking your groove thing? What would you be like in these worlds? So it's, 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 a, <laughs> it's a pretty wild thing because you wouldn't believe the stuff that comes out of people. It, I will say on the most part, everybody shocks themselves. You know, uh, like you know that that sparked an idea for what will probably become an article, <laughs> uh, right. or, or something. Uh, I think you know, and who knows, maybe it'll become a section of my book. But I, I'm beginning to get this idea that we do our best work when creation becomes its own reward. Yes. And uh, knowing that, uh, and being somebody who now gets paid to write books, yeah, I want to know how you maintain the balance between how you how do you maintain the balance between that? How do you not lose sight of that? when in fact you are a professional? Like how do the people who are aspiring professionals bring what it is that person who doesn't have a care worry in the world brings to the stage or to that work? Well, I think one of the things is, again, not looking at the result. Something that really has grown very evident in me, and it came from being a teacher, and in that the work that we always do in my classroom is process work, not product work. Always. And because what we want to do when we, I think when we go into the audition room is we want to show, we want to show these people, Hey, this is what this song does to me. And it's not polished and it's not perfect, but I'm right. I'm in the moment and I'm in the music. And what I think it is, is if you can come into, if we're using musical theater, which I think applies to going in for a job interview or, you know, um, anything that we're doing to put our, our work out there. That we come in and say, this is me in the process I'm in with this material and how I, I want you to see how I play with material. I want you to witness me being in my experience. So rather than saying, I'm doing this and I'm showing you so that you accept me, I want you to see me so you take me. Instead, it's, I'm going to come into the room and I'm going to play with the material. I'm going to show you how this material lives in me. It is for me and my process as an artist to see where I am right now, how the music affects me, um, you know, how am I expressing myself? And when I leave, I get to go, hey, how did, how did I do with my work? Did I do a good job? Was I present? Was I nervous? Where was I in my process with it? Um, did anything affect it? And then as somebody who comes in as an act of generosity, you get to go, hey, I want to do my best work so that these people could see me and one, have a great time with me and enjoy my company and enjoy being with me being present. We could all be present with each other, you know, like listening to a record together. Can my presence in the room be something that one, gives them good energy and a good vibe um, by me being present with them, but secondly, in some way, can the way I live in my work serve them and the work they're doing? So even if I'm not right for the show and I did my best, there might be something that they could go, you know what I loved? When that girl Sherry came in and gave that point of view on that character, she wasn't right for the role, but I loved that. I loved that thing she did. And that might very well create a change in the script or it might influence you know, a quality that they want to bring out in somebody who is right for the role and to see, I wonder if that person who is right for the role can pursue that thing that Sherry brought in. That all we want to do is make sure that we're in service to two things. One, our own creative process, and two, in service to who we're sharing ourselves with so that in some way we can give them a gift of either showing them a good time or being honest being present and having a good experience with us or something that might affect in a positive way, the process they're having as creative people. So ultimately I think it's being in service to yourself and the people that you come into rather than please pick me because I have no value unless you pick me. Hmm. It's ultimately, I think an act of generosity and service 
towards yourself and towards other people. It's taking the ego out for that those two minutes and being in service to everyone involved. So I, I want to wrap with two yeah. last questions. Uh, yeah. The this one is is one that I've asked a handful of people mainly because it's been really interesting to see what they've, they've come up with. So yeah. Um, you know, kind of stealing a, uh, a page from the Tim Ferriss playbook, but I would like to know uh, one book, movie, or piece of art that has profoundly influenced your life. <gasps> oh my God. Book, movie, or piece of art that has influenced my life. Could be a music album too. Or a music album. Wow. I, that's such a great question. I don't even know the answer to that. Um, I will, can, um, how about an album? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, given who we're talking to that, that's what I would have expected. That's why I threw that option out there. Yeah, thank you. Because, um, there are so many books and so many things, you know, like I listened to Brene Brown's audio book and it completely turned me upside down. You know, she, you know, she's incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I love people like Pema Chodron and I, I, there's so many people that I love, but if I could think of one that has influenced my creativity, I would say uh, it is the Eli and the 13th Confession album uh, sung by the late, great Laura Nero. Um, you may not know her um, because she's kind of a cult hero um, amongst people, but she was somebody who was a songwriter that was around for some time. She she passed... Um, in the early nineties, I believe. Um, and she was the most prolific songwriter. Um, she would combine, uh, R and B blues, gospel, doo-wop, folk music, rock music. I mean, she, she combined everything and everybody sang her music. Three dog night, blood, sweat and tears, the fifth dimension, uh, Frank Sinatra, Linda Ronstadt, Barbara. St- I mean, everybody sang her music. Her, her influence on me came in um, in my early 20s. And what she taught me as a musician is that her music goes through, so any song of hers could go through, you know, six or seven changes within one song. She's a real poet. Um, and her music does not make any sense um, not, no, that's not true. It is open for completely open for interpretation because it's so poetic. But the one thing about her music I think that influenced me the most is that, as a teacher and as a person, is that in a song, say she's got six changes in feel. And it changes from one feeling to another feeling to another feeling to another feeling to another feeling. Her grooves change like the weather changes. And what she taught me was how to ride change and how to move through changes in life and how to move through changes in music. And that how I teach my students is when you sing a cut of a song, so say you sing a 16-bar a cut of a song for an audition, you're moving through a change. You're going from the verse into the chorus or the bridge into the chorus or the bridge into the verse. So I want to see you change. I want to see you change from dark to light. I want to see you change from I'm hurt to I'm still hurt, but I think I'm going to be okay. So she taught me about that intricate space where we move from one feeling to another. And and how that space and the way we move and change feelings is, is a hot spot for miracles and creativity. It's that moment where things change and shift and how you move from one feeling to another. That is where your magic is and your creativity is and your uniqueness and your individuality. That's where we get to find out about you. So that's the gift I got from this woman. (laughs) It's how we change. Wow. Yeah. I love that. Um, Yeah, too. (laughs) I want to finish with my final question, which I know you've heard me ask. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Well, um, and I've loved a lot of the answers people have given. To say, I would say my answer to that would be curiosity. Hmm. 
and how each person's individual curiosity about their own life is, is what makes them unmistakable. Unmistakable, unique, one of a kind, um, march to their own drum is, it is specifically and this is just my opinion because it obviously a lot your your other guests have had other brilliant opinions about this but to me it's how the curios the way in which you have a curiosity about life hmm. yeah well this has just been filled with poetic nuggets i, I love it um <laughs> There's so much gold in this, so I I, thank I can't you. thank you enough for reaching there's, out. I'm so happy that you reached oh, out to me. There's uh, so much gold in what you guys are doing, so I, it's really a privilege to be with you. And and I've and and again, thank you for asking such wonderful, personal, provocative, evocative questions for me. I, I think it's been an incredible time with you. Yeah, and for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that next time on the Unmistakable Creative. What I realized is that ego was really the problem. Everyone wants to be humble, but why can't they? It's ego is the problem. And as I flesh this out, it's like ego is the enemy of all these things that we're trying to do, whether it's write a book or start a company or you know be successful inside a company or have relationship. Ego is why these overconfident you know 17-year-olds are sending me these crazy emails. Author Ryan Holiday returns to the show to talk about his new book, Ego is the Enemy.